Okay, today is November 2nd, and BA 230, Fall 2021, and today we're going to be talking about tort law. All right, so today we're going to be talking about uh, civil, again this is civil law, not criminal, although there is a lot of overlap between civil tort law and criminal law. Remember, criminal law is a law that has as a potential jail time. Typically, criminal law involves a wrongful act against another person or damage to property or other type of similar activity or damage to society, like uh, driving under the influence if you don't run into anybody, but it's still a societal issue. So we have criminal law, and then we have tort law, which is sort of on a parallel track, in a way. Uh, and again, there's a lot of overlap, which we'll talk about as we work our way through. So first of all, I want you to know what this word tort means. Right here, tort. A tort is a French-derived word that refers to a wrongful act. So the word tort or sometimes it's called tortious. A tortious act is when someone does something that harms another person, either intentionally or even if it's not intentionally, in violation of a duty, which we call negligence, or in violation of a law, which is strict liability. And the idea of tort law is that if you harm someone or you damage their property, either intentionally or in violation of a duty, negligently, or you damage their reputation, like in a libel case where you publish something false, or you damage their business, interference with a contract. Those are all forms of a tort. And again, a tort is a wrongful act that leads to liability in civil court. So in other words, the wrongful act allows the victim of the tort to file a civil lawsuit against the person who committed the act in civil court and to seek whatever remedy is appropriate, be it monetary damages, a legal remedy, or it could be an equitable remedy such as a court order to cease and desist or to have no contact or what, whatever the case may be on an equitable remedy. So basically, a tort is a wrongful act. That's what I'm leading up to. Now, back to criminal law. I'm going to flip over a page here real quick. Actually, two pages. So tort, means a wrongful act, whereby the person who committed the action can be sued and held liable in civil court for that wrongful action. Now, let's go back to page 53. So I want to talk about the interaction of criminal and civil law and Essentially, here's the, the, the idea. A person may commit a wrongful act against someone else, or a business, or whatever, and that action could be a crime, that is, violation of a criminal law. It could also be a tort, the very same action. So they may be prosecuted for the crime. They may then be sued in civil court for a tort, and potentially it would also be a breach of contract. We'll get into contract law uh, probably starting next week. So let me give you an example of what I'm talking about. We have this interaction of the various different types and categories of law. So let's say I am your uh, financial advisor, and you hire me to run your retirement plan for you and your employees. And so we enter into a contract and I'm going to charge you a fee in exchange for providing these services, financial advice, and that kind of thing. So let's say I essentially start taking money, skimming money off of your retirement plan. 
So that's a crime, that's theft. It's also a tort. It would be conversion, among other things, fraud, deceit, and among other things. And that's also a breach of contract, because I have a contract with you where I will provide you with financial advice in exchange for a fee, but I'm not, it doesn't allow me to skim money. So that one same action, taking money that I'm not entitled to as your financial advisor, I could be prosecuted for the crime and put in prison. I could also then be sued for the very same action in civil court for various torts that I've committed, and also sued for breach of contract in that same civil lawsuit. So the point I'm making is <clears throat> one action may violate multiple different categories of law, criminal, civil, tort law, criminal, civil, contract law, and potentially other areas of civil law. And so we have this interaction between criminal and civil law that they're kind of intertwined with each other. Now, again, remember, if it's a criminal case, that can only be prosecuted by a government. So the criminal case would have to be initiated by the government, either the federal government or a state government. And the proof has to be beyond a reasonable doubt. So the proof in a criminal case is at the highest level burden of proof, like we talked about last class, and that is proof beyond a reasonable doubt, very high standard. So the civil case, that's both contract law and tort law, civil, in a civil lawsuit, the individual person has the ability to file a civil lawsuit, in, a, in, a, in essence, prosecute the case themselves. Now, that's usually done with an attorney representing the person. In fact, that's what the word attorney means. I don't know if you knew that, but attorney at law. The word attorney comes from atonement, which is a word that means you are doing something on behalf of someone else. So when I'm an attorney at law, I'm doing, I'm representing you for legal purposes. You can also have other kinds of attorney, like power of attorney, where I could appoint my brother as power of attorney and he could act on my behalf to sign checks and pay my bills and that kind of thing. Sorry, a little aside there, but anyway. So, in a civil tort case, unlike criminal, the individual person or their family, maybe it's a wrongful death case, and so the family sues, has the ability to file their own lawsuit. Now again, the proof standard in a civil case is preponderance of the evidence. Preponderance of evidence. And remember from last time, Preponderance of the evidence standard is a lower standard than beyond a reasonable doubt. Beyond a reasonable doubt is roughly 99% proof, very high standard, and the reason for that is potential jail time as a penalty. Proof to a preponderance of the evidence is a much lower standard, basically 50.1%. Now, what I'm leading up to here is another kind of interesting situation. A person may be accused of a crime. They may go to a trial in criminal court, and the jury may find them not guilty, or the judge, depending on the type of trial. So they may be found not guilty of the criminal case because there was insufficient evidence to prove they were guilty beyond a reasonable doubt. So they're found not guilty of the crime. But they may then be sued in civil court for the very same situation, and they may be found liable in civil court 
And the reason why is it's a lower burden of proof. That's the O.J. Simpson murder case, right? O.J. Simpson was found not guilty of homicide in criminal court, but he was sued in civil court for what's called wrongful death, which is the civil equivalent in tort law of homicide. And he was found liable in civil court. And the reason why is it's a lower burden of proof. All you have to show is that there was some causation. You don't have to prove all of the criminal elements of a homicide. So found not guilty of the crime because it's a higher level burden of proof, but then found liable in civil court. And that happens here and there. Now let's flip it around. If a person is convicted of a crime, they're essentially automatically at fault in civil court because they have already been convicted on a higher standard of proof that is beyond a reasonable doubt. So if you're convicted of murder, essentially you're automatically liable for wrongful death because you've already been convicted on a higher level burden of proof. So it's kind of an interesting thing. So that's also a common situation where somebody commits a crime, they injure someone, maybe it's driving under the influence and they get into a car wreck and they hurt somebody, they're convicted of the DUI, they're then sued in civil court for the injuries that they caused. And essentially they're automatically at fault. Now I'm not gonna to get too much more into that interplay, I wanna really focus more on the specific types of torts, but I want you to understand as we work our way through this list of torts, and then negligence, and strict liability, the three categories, <coughs> oftentimes the examples that I'm going to be giving you are also a crime. So you're gonna say, wait a minute, you can't do that, that's illegal. Yeah, it is, it's a crime, but it's also a tort, okay? So we're gonna be focusing on the civil torts, and oftentimes they have the same name as the crime, and oftentimes they don't. And I will also let you know that it depends on what state you're in, because each state has their own different tort laws, and they go by different names from one state to the next. So it's not uniform across the country, uh, but we're gonna go over the, the most common ones and the common names. All right, so with that said, back to page 52. So, there are three broad categories of tort law. The first are torts that are called intentional torts. These are wrongful acts that are committed intentionally, purposefully. They're done, that's what the outcome was wanted by the person who committed the wrongful act. They did it on purpose, basically. Typically, an intentional tort is a worse kind of a tort in many ways because it is done on purpose. Oftentimes, an intentional tort is also a crime. That's pretty common. So, today we are gonna focus on intentional torts, and I'm gonna give you a list here of, I believe, 17 of them, if I remember correctly. And I want you just to remember that these all require some level of purposeful conduct, intentional conduct. Not accidental, not unintentional, but a purposeful, not necessarily premeditated, meaning you thought about it ahead of time, but at the time, at the moment, the action was done intentionally. The next type of tort is called negligence. Negligence is more common. In fact, it is, I would say, the most common type of a tort. Negligence is based on the idea that everyone has an obligation or a duty or a responsibility, whatever word you want to use, to other people at all times in all things that they do in everyday life, be it driving or whatever. And you cause an injury to another person or you damage their property 
or you damage their reputation or whatever, you've caused them some harm, <clears throat> but you did not do it on purpose. In fact, you did not want that harm to occur in the first place, but you were negligent, you violated a duty, and therefore, even though you didn't intend to cause the harm, nor did you want to hurt the person or damage their property, but you did as a result of not following a responsibility level that you were required to follow, a duty. Classic example of negligence is an automobile accident. You're driving down the road, you're playing with your radio, and you don't see somebody in the crosswalk and you run into them. Now you didn't want to do that. You did not do it on purpose. You just weren't paying attention. Well. That's not an excuse. You will still be responsible, liable, in court because you were negligent. You failed to follow your duty, which is violation of the, the crosswalk rules under state traffic code. Failure to yield to a pedestrian is the technical term. You failed to keep a proper lookout. That led to the accident where you hurt someone. So it doesn't matter that you did not mean to do it you are still responsible for paying for the damages that you caused. Medical bills, lost wages, pain and suffering, disfigurement, loss of use of maybe the leg and the function of the leg, somebody can't ski anymore or something like that. So you will be responsible for all that. That's why you have to have insurance, because the insurance will help pay for that. All right, so at the top, we have intentional torts. Below that, we have negligence, which I like to call, I don't like the word accident. I like the word unintentional, meaning you didn't intend to do it, but you're still responsible. And then finally, we have what's called strict liability, and we'll get into that. We'll get into negligence and strict liability next class. Um, but basically, the idea of strict liability, I refer to it as no fault, meaning you, if you are the one in charge of an activity, that's regulated by law, and somebody's injured, you're responsible for it, their injuries to pay for their medical bills, etc. even though you didn't have anything to do with the situation other than you're responsible. Classic example is workers' compensation law. That is, if I'm your employer and you get hurt on the job in the course and scope of your work, I'm responsible as your employer for your injuries under workers' compensation. It's a form of strict liability. Even though I didn't cause your injury, even though I wasn't violating any rules that you actually hurt yourself, but I, because I'm your employer, the law requires that I carry workers' compensation insurance or I'm personally liable for your injuries if I don't carry the insurance. So those are three categories of tort law. They are distinct from each other in many ways, um, but they all fall under this umbrella of tort law in general. Now, again, as we work our way through, today we're going to focus on intentional torts. Next time we'll talk about negligence and strict liability. So let's get into the intentional torts. I think it's page 55, if I remember. No, 56. All right. So as you can see here at the top, before I get going, for a fill in the blank question, this is a 100 percenter. I always ask this on the midterm. List six types of intentional torts. And I believe on this page and on the next page, that's where they're coming from. I think there are 17 of them altogether, if I remember. <clears throat> so I want you to list six. Now, again, as we work our way through these 17 various torts, all of these are intentional torts. And what I mean by that is you can put the word intentional in front of the name. So intentional battery, intentional assault, intentional infliction of emotional distress. So all of these torts on these next two pages will require proof 
that the person that committed the action did so in some form of intentional or purposeful way. In other words, they are not accidental, unintentional. There has to be some level of thought or uh, action involved that was done purposefully. Okay. So let's start off with the classic intentional tort. That is battery. All right. Battery is the intentional, that is, you did it on purpose, harmful or offensive contact with another person without consent or justification. By definition, a contact is harmful if it produces an injury. All right, so let me break that down. We call these elements. These are the elements that need to be proven in court if you sue somebody for a battery. So first of all, it has to be an intentional action. Not, oops, I didn't mean to do that. It has to be done purposefully. Now, when I talk about an intentional action with battery, I want you to focus on the contact. There has to be a touching between the people or objects that they control. So classic example of a battery is I walk up to you and I punch you in the nose just because I wanted to. And that's classic battery. I did it on purpose. I had contact with you. It caused an injury or even if it didn't cause an injury, it was certainly offensive in nature. That's classic battery. So the first thing, and that's the reason I have the word contact in all caps, there must be a contact in order for there to be a battery. If there is no contact, if I, if I go to hit you and I miss, that's not a battery because I did not actually make contact with you. Now, the word contact can also be not necessarily body to body. It could be I hit you with a golf club. I didn't actually touch you, but the golf club that was in my hand that I hit you with hit your body. Or it could be I ran you over with my car on purpose. I didn't actually touch you, but the car that was under my control did. Or you're in your car, I'm in my car, and I run into you on purpose and you get hurt. Even though we didn't actually have physical bodily contact, I initiated the contact that led to, you, you get the idea, right? So it, it's not physical body contact necessarily. Now it could also be another situation. It could be, I have contact with something you're wearing. So maybe I walk up to you and I, you're wearing a backpack, let's say. And I grab your backpack and I throw you to the ground. So I didn't actually touch you, but I grabbed the backpack that was on your body and threw you to the ground. That would also be a battery. So I want you to focus on this word contact. If there is no contact, there is no battery. Now there may be another tort involved, but it won't be a battery. All right, part two. And this is where it gets a little tricky. Intentional, intentional contact. That's why I have an arrow. That's drawn from the word intentional to contact. The contact must be done on purpose. So there's two ways to look at this, okay? First of all, if I hit you, I punch you in the nose, and I want to injure you, that's clearly a battery. I intended to make contact with your nose. That's clearly a battery. But what if I did not mean to hurt you, but I did mean to have contact with you? Intentional contact. But I did not intend to actually injure you. That could still be a battery. So this is kind of a dumb example, but it illustrates my point. You guys ever heard of the game Slug Bug? Or Cruiser Bruiser or something like that? Slug Bug? No? Okay. My kids used to play this all the time in the back seat. It drove me crazy when they were little, right? So we're driving, you know, going somewhere, and they're in the back seat. And slug bug, you see a Volkswagen Beetlebug car, and so you punch somebody, right, in the shoulder or whatever. 
Slug bug, and you pipe shot. Now let's say we're playing slug bug and I haul off and hit you after I see a Volkswagen Beetle and I break your collarbone. Oops. <laughs> I did not mean, nor did I want to hurt you, but I did intend to have contact with you. So that's still a battery. So here's the point I'm making. A battery does not require an intentional injury. You are responsible for whatever injury flows out of the contact. However, the contact must be intentional. So if I'm reaching to get, this actually happened to me. I was reaching to get my wallet. I was in line at Trader Joe's. I'm reaching to get my wallet out of my uh, pocket. And as my elbow came up, there was a person standing behind me in line a little bit too close. I didn't notice him, and as I came up, my elbow hit them. Now, unfortunately, they weren't hurt, but I was thinking about that. That was an unintentional contact, right? So the idea is the contact must be intentional. That's what I want you to focus on. So it's not the injury. So true or false, in order for there to be a battery, you must intend to injure the person. The answer is false. It doesn't matter that you didn't intend to hurt them, it's the contact that leads to it, all right? So, there's basically two points there. Point number one, clearly it's a battery if I intended to hurt you. That's not even a question. But it could still be a battery even if I didn't intend to injure you, but I did intend to have the contact. That's the slug bug example, all right? So, it must be a purposeful contact. All right, let's look at the next two elements. Harmful or offensive. Harmful or offensive. I have the word or highlighted there for a reason. A battery requires either harmful or offensive contact. So harmful is the easy one. Let's start with that. Harmful is an injury, caused you harm, an injury, that's easy. But a battery may also occur even if there is no physical injury, if the contact that was intentional is offensive. And a classic example there is maybe going up to somebody and spitting in their face on purpose. And it doesn't necessarily cause a physical injury, assuming there's no communicable diseases or anything like that. It's just gross, right? Clearly offensive. You did it on purpose, it's an offensive contact. Or another classic example of an offensive type of battery is maybe somebody is at a restaurant and the server comes up and they swat them on the rear end. Didn't cause any physical injury, it was done intentionally, but that would be considered an offensive contact, right? Um, or something like that. Actually, prop, I, the spitting example is also potentially a crime. It's a class B misdemeanor called harassment. I, mean, I prosecute people on that. So, um, so the point I'm making on battery is it requires either an injury or an offensive contact. So true or false, in order for there to be a battery, there must be an injury. Answer, false. Why? The contact may not cause an injury, but it's, if it's offensive, then it's still a battery. Now, the way it works in the real world is typically the worse the injury, the more money is awarded, right? Um, or money may be awarded in an offensive contact, even without an injury, if on a punitive level, to punish somebody for the offensive contact that they had. So the contact must be intentional. There also must be a harmful or offensive. So don't get, I actually have that test question that comes up, true or false, there must be an injury. That, that's one that gets generated quite often for my midterm. <clears throat> All right. Without, let's go to the next elements here, without consent or Justification. So consent. A person may consent to a battery. You agree to it. Now when would you do that? 
Well, people do it all the time. Surgery, right? Surgery is a battery. A surgeon goes in and cuts you open on purpose. That's a purposeful injury caused by a surgeon. But you consented to it, or at least hopefully, unless they operated on the wrong knee, <laughs> something like that, took out the wrong kidney. Ooh. That's called medical malpractice. So a surgery is a form of a battery. However, it's not a tort because it's done with consent. That's why whenever you have surgery, you sign all that's called informed consent. All the forms, sometimes like in knee surgery, I've seen doctors have little stickers they'll put on that look like a stop sign. And they put it on the knee that's not to be operated on. And then you take a Sharpie and both you and your doctor initial the knee that is to be operated on. That way the doctor doesn't mess up. So it's an informed consent. That's one form of a battery that is consensual. Can you think of other types of contact that may lead to an injury that you do on purpose and you agree to? All the time. There's sports channel, or I already said it. There's channels dedicated to it, right? Sports. So football, basketball, you know, mixed martial arts, Pretty much any sport, there is an element of potential contact involved, or that's the whole game. You know, uh, golf, uh, ping pong, high contact sports, right? That's a joke, come on. So the idea is that you consent by engaging in the activity to the contact that is relative to the activity. Some sports obviously have more contact than others. So that's a form of consent. All right, the next word is justification. Justification is a fancy way of saying uh, you are acting under a legal right to do that. So one form of justification to a battery is self-defense. You were defending yourself because you had a, reasonably, a reasonable belief that you were going to be harmed by the person, and so you're defending yourself or another person. That's one form of justification, uh, making an arrest by a police officer uh, is another form of justification. Uh, certain kinds of restraints uh, for you know, parenting and, and children, that kind of thing, has to be reasonable. So the idea of justification is there is a legal right to do what was done. And that's a defense to battery. <clears throat> so consent or justification. All right, let's move on to the next one. The next intentional tort is assault. Assault is basically the threat of committing a battery, but there was no actual contact. Now these two go together hand in hand, assault and battery, you hear that all the time. So basically an assault is putting somebody in fear, again you're doing it intentionally, Putting someone in fear that you're going to have contact with them or threatening a battery. So if I pull out my baseball bat and I start chasing after you, screaming, I'm going to hit you, I'm not the fastest runner, and you clearly you can outrun me and go around me three times before I go anywhere. So I'm threatening you and you run away. Now I didn't actually have contact with you, but I put you in fear of an imminent battery. And I did that on purpose. I scared you on purpose. There's no actual contact made, but the threat was intentional and imminent. That is right now. Not, hey, I'm going to hit you with a baseball bat a year from now on you know, Tuesday. Um, that's not imminent. It has to be an imminent threat. So basically, an assault, I swing my bat and I miss. A battery, I swing my bat and I make contact. Now, here's what's interesting. Well, not really interesting, but a little point. An assault does not require contact, but it does require fear. That is, the victim must actually have been aware and have been put in to a position of being afraid. So part of an assault is the victim having knowledge of the imminent threat. 
And the theory behind that is that there is a, even though you haven't physically harmed anyone or made contact, the act of putting somebody in fear in and of itself is a form of an injury. It may be uh, you know, an emotional or psychological type of an injury. But the fact of being put in fear is an injury that is compensable. That's the basic theory behind that. So a battery does not necessarily require knowledge by the victim, but it requires an intentional contact that causes harm or is offensive. So let's say a person's in a coma. And I swing the bat at them, and I'm threatening to hurt them. But they're in a coma. They're totally unaware of what I'm doing. So you can't really have an assault because the person's in a coma. But you can have a battery. Even though they're in a coma, if I injure them on purpose, that is still a battery. So it's, it's kind of an interesting concept there. So an assault requires an intentional threat imminent, meaning right now, that actually puts the victim in fear. No contact is necessary, but the person must actually be aware of it. In a battery, there must be contact, not necessarily an injury, but it doesn't matter if the person's aware of it or not. All right. Now, obviously, you can have both of these. When I pull out my baseball bat and I start chasing you down and screaming, I'm going to hit you, and I catch up with you, and then I do hit you, that's both, right? Also, these are usually also a crime. Now, this is where it gets confusing. I won't test you on this, but just so you know for the real world. In Oregon, the criminal act of a battery is actually called an assault. We have four different levels, assault first, assault one through assault four. I remember we looked at assault two with the belt buckle case. So that's a criminal equivalent. So we don't call it a battery in criminal law, we call it an assault. In Oregon, an assault in criminal law is either a harassment, which is a form, or a, excuse me, battery may also be a harassment if there's no injury. In Oregon, an ass a civil assault in criminal law is called menacing. Menacing, putting somebody in fear or threat, or it may be some other crime like pointing a firearm at somebody. You don't actually shoot them, but you're scaring them. So um, they go by different names. All right, next we have false imprisonment. All right, again, this is an intentional tort. So this is an action that must be done intentionally by the person. So the tort of false imprisonment requires confinement. And I wrote up here, or movement, <coughs> which is a derivative of confinement. But <coughs> confinement, meaning when I lock you in my trunk, in my car, or movement, I grab you by the arm and I'm dragging you down the street. So that's another way that you can get here. For some appreciable amount of time, without consent, or justification, that's privilege, and the person is aware of their confinement. So a classic example here is like a kidnapping. Kidnapping would be the criminal equivalent, um, and kidnapping in Oregon is basically moving or confining somebody without consent, against their will, uh, without legal right to do so, like making an arrest, all right? So let me give you an example, you tell me what you think. So let's say I'm a bus driver, school bus, and my job is to drive kindergarten through sixth grade, K through six, kids, 
pick them up in the morning, drop them off in the afternoon. So one day I'm driving my bus route, you know, and I, I know my kids because I drive them every day. I know where they live, uh, you know, kind of out in our rural route like we have here in Polk County. And so one day I'm driving back to the bus barn after my shift, and I don't notice that little Johnny, who's a first grader, is asleep in the back seat in the bus. And so I go and lock the bus up in the bus barn for the night, shut off all the lights, lock the doors, and I head on home for supper. Of course, little Johnny wakes up in the middle of the night. The parents are going crazy because they don't know where their child is. Little Johnny is afraid and screaming. And eventually, we track him down at 3 in the morning in the bus in the bus barn. Is that this tort? We have confinement, appreciable amount of time. Well, Johnny is aware of the confinement, all of those things. No justification for me to do that. But is it that tort? If not, why not? Yeah, you're shaking your head no. Why? Do you have your knowledge? Oh, you're on the right track. Yeah. Um, would that fall under the category of like negligence? Okay, yeah. So in other words, there's no intent. I did not intend, I think that's what you meant too. I did not intend to lock little Johnny in the bus bar. I just was not following my duty. That's the negligence side here, so you're spot on. I was not following my duty to go through and make sure the bus is clear before I lock it up for the night. And also to make sure little Johnny got off at his bus stop, you know, out there on the farm. So that's actually, those cases are pretty common. I mean, they're not like everyday thing, but you read about them, you know, probably once a year. Um, they do happen quite often. So the idea is there has to be the word intentional in front of these. So intentional battery, intentional assault, intentional false imprisonment. So you guys are exactly on the right track. Now, yes, that could be negligence. So the intentional tort would lose in civil court. But negligence for failure, for breach of duty as a bus driver, that's where we have that interlap. So, yeah, we'll talk more about negligence next time. But, yeah, there's, inter, there's interlocking or overlap um, on these torts. And you brought up a good point. Both of you did on that example because you may be sued for more than one tort. So there may be an assault. There may be a battery. There may be a, a false imprisonment. And there may also be intentional infliction of emotional distress. So it's not just one tort. You know, you're going to have to pick one. You can have multiple different torts, multiple different theories that form the basis of a lawsuit. And then the jury can decide which ones are appropriate, along with the judge. <clears throat> All right. Or without privilege. So privilege in terms of false imprisonment usually pertains to making an arrest. Uh, so let me give you another example. This is a case I had a long time ago back, oh boy, 93 maybe, uh, been a few years. So um, this was up in the Portland area, large grocery store, and a person basically uh, stole, oh, it was like a six pack of Dr. Pepper or something. Nothing major, theft three, which is a low level misdemeanor. Uh, so the security guard arrested the person, took him back to the back of the store where they had a little office. And in the office there, they had, you know, uh, concrete cinder or concrete blocks. And on top of the blocks, they had a 2 by 12 board. And so on the board, you know, basically a, a bench that they made. And on the board, they had bolted into the, the wood plank handcuffs. And so the security guard took the person back. Clearly, they had committed the crime of shoplifting. Took him back to the security office and handcuffed him to this board uh, bench and left him there for six hours before they called the police. Now, eventually, they called the police, reported the shoplift, and back then, the police would show up for that. And the police showed up, arrested him for assault th or theft in the third degree, Eventually, they pled guilty to the, the charge. And then they turned around and sued the store and the security guard for false imprisonment. Why? 
the, the security guard at the time was justified in making the arrest for shoplifting, right? But that went beyond the scope of the privilege to make an arrest, the justification. It, it crossed the line between making an arrest and intentionally punishing the person, basically. So they ended up settling that case, but I always thought that was interesting. You know, the person committed a crime, but it went beyond the reasonable scope of the security officer making the arrest. Does that make sense? And, and that's really what was going on. They were punishing the person uh, by not calling the police right away. <clears throat> Now, what would have been interesting in that one, and this is more theory, but what if the security guard called the police like right away, but it took the police officer six hours to show up? Don't know on that one. Now, clearly if the person that was handcuffed, you, know, you weren't giving them water and that kind of thing. Um, so that, that's where it gets kind of interesting in court. All right, let's move on. Letter D, infliction of emotional distress. Now again, this is intentional. This could also be done recklessly, which is a conscious disregard for someone. Um, so this is the idea that somebody engages in purposeful, outrageous conduct that causes severe emotional distress in another person and, and is the type of distress that the average reasonable person would incur. In other words, the, the victim is not being you know, hypersensitive or overreactive or whatever the case may be. Now this is a very subjective tort in many ways. And a lot of this will depend on the thought process of the person committing the act and then also what the jury believes to be either outrageous or unreasonable uh, in, in the facts. So let me give you some examples. All right, so uh, I'm just going to use sports as an example. So a World Series, so let's say I'm a, a Houston fan or an Atlanta fan, it doesn't really matter. And I'm just, you're a fan from the other team, and I'm just giving you a super hard time. Oh, your pitchers are horrible, your batters can't hit. You know, you might as well just have a walker when you're running the bases because you're so slow. I mean, I'm just giving you a hard time. And I'm doing it on purpose because I want to cause you emotional sports distress, whatever, right? So I'm doing it on purpose. And let's say that you are so upset by that that you have to go to the hospital and have treatment because you're so upset about me dishing on your team that it causes you severe emotional distress. Is that this tort? If not, why not? I'm doing it on purpose, so we have the intentional part. But I don't think that that would get to that level. You know, assuming what I'm doing is kind of the average reasonable, not reasonable, average dishing that goes on between sports fans. Why? There are probably two answers to that. The first one is, is that outrageous? Now, you may think it is. But that's for a jury to decide. And they say, well, you know, that's kind of the norm in sports fandom, if you will. Didn't really cross any lines, doesn't cause a physical injury. And then part two is they might say, well, you're just being, you know, overreactive on, in that scenario. All right, let me give you another scenario. Let's say you're my neighbor, and I don't like you for whatever reason it is. Now let's say you have uh, a little toddler, a little you know, baby girl who's nine months old, ten months, just starting to walk. And I call you up on the phone one day and I say, I just saw your little girl get run over by the UPS driver out in the street. She's dead. Turns out it's a lie. Your little girl's upstairs asleep in her bed. But you run out and you, right there you have a heart attack on the floor. Or you run outside and you're screaming and yelling and you can't find, you know, in other words, severe emotional distress. That a little different? Yeah. So I'm doing it on purpose. I think a jury would pretty much consider that to be outrageous. I know I would. 
And the average person would also have a severe emotional distress under those situations, and it's done intentionally. And it's my intent to cause you that harm, because I don't like you for whatever reason. So you see the difference in magnitude. Now, again, that's a very subjective tort. Uh, it's really up depending on the facts and circumstances of the case and what the jury uh, comes to a decision. It's very much fact dependent. Remember, fa issues of fact and issues of law. Um, all right, let's move on. <clears throat> okay, next we get to letter E, defamation. All right, defamation is a tort that goes back to Old English common law, which is, of course, carried over to the United States. And this is a tort that's based upon the idea that somebody says a, makes a false statement about another person, either verbally or in a, a written format or some other media format. And again, we gotta go back to English common law for the roots of this tort. It's before we had television and internet and telephones, and, you know, pretty much you had verbal communication and you had written communication. And so the idea of defamation is someone makes a false statement about another person. And as a result of that false statement, the person who is being talked about has their reputation tarnished, damaged, and therefore they can sue in civil court for defamation. So first of all, there are two types of defamation, and I want you to understand the difference between the two. They're both based on the same idea of a false statement. The first is slander and libel. And I'm going to start with slander. Slander is verbal defamation. Historically, it is verbal uh, false statements. So I'm up in front of the classroom and I start making false statements about somebody. It's not written down. That's classic slander. Verbal lying about another person. Libel has its roots back. Again, this is going back to English common law. Libel historically was written false statements that were published. So a classic example is a newspaper story that was published on purpose, intentionally, knowing it was false with the intent to harm someone. So the idea, libel historically was written, slander was purely verbal. And that difference, uh, the reason why, is written libel was considered to be worse. And the reason why is when the false statement is published in a newspaper or a pamphlet or a billboard or whatever, it's there in a semi-permanent uh, state. And you're never, you don't really know who may read that and when they may read it even years from now. And so because it's in this physical semi-permanent state, it, ha it has a worse effect on damaging your reputation. So libel historically, and this is still true today, is considered to be worse than slander, purely verbal. So I get up and lie about somebody in front of you know, eight people or 20 people or 100 people, it doesn't really matter. But once I say the words, they're gone. They evaporate or whatever happens to my words. Whereas when I publish them, they're there potentially forever, especially with digital media, right? So now let's fast forward to today. Now we have all sorts of media. Obviously we have newspapers, we have television, we have radio, we have the internet of course, which is fertile ground for libel cases. Uh, we have TikTok and, and all of the different, you know, YouTube and this tube and that tube and your tube and my tube and their tube and up tube and down tube and all of them, right? And so 
we now have uh, all these different modes of communication. And so this line between slander and liable, where does it end and where does it begin? So let's just say talk radio, for example. That's a, a verbal format. You're listening to it. It's, a, it's an audio format. It's not visual, it's audio. But it, talk radio or, or podcasts on the internet for that matter, even though it's verbal in nature, it's different than me just talking to you face to face, right? Because it's in a medium and that medium can be reviewed over and over again. So in that case, it's, even though it's verbal, it's more like liable than slander under the theory that it potentially could last forever and be rebroadcast, et cetera. So essentially the rule nowadays is anything that's in a hard, hard format or mass media format, including digital, is considered to be liable and not slander. Slander is still pretty much verbal communication only um, or perhaps by telephone. Uh, that's not being recorded, it's you know, a, a one-time conversation. So libel could be the internet, it could be a statue, it could be a billboard, it could be radio, television, uh, TripAdvisor, Amazon reviews, all those things. That's where we're seeing a lot of activity in the digital realm is libel cases based on bad reviews. Um, that we're seeing a lot of that activity now. I'll come back to that in a moment. All right, so basic difference, libel, historically written or printed, but nowadays that also includes essentially any sort of mass media, slander, oral defamation. Now, again, the idea that libel is worse than slander. Here's how it plays out. In a libel case, you don't necessarily have to prove that you actually had harm that resulted. The mere fact of publishing the false statement is sufficient for you to be able to file a lawsuit. Historically slander, purely verbal, was different. Historically slander also required that you could prove that as a result of the false statement, something bad happened to you. So somebody lies about me to my employer, let's say, verbally, and I get fired. And it's not true, so I sue for slander. I can prove that there was a direct connection between me losing my job and the false statement. So you had to be able to prove that there was some bad outcome, where liable you did not have to prove that. Now there are exceptions to that, it gets a little bit technical, which I won't get into. Um, but for you guys, just suffice to say that liable is worse than slander in, in that respect. All right, let's move on. So the next statement, or the next issue, is publication. So the word publication uh, in everyday language, you, you know, it's a newspaper, whatever. But it, it, it's, it's more than just that. One of the elements that has to be proven is that the statement was made, either in writing or verbally, to a third party. In other words, if I walk up to you and I accuse you of being a heroin dealer, uh, child pornographer and all kinds of bad things, and I say that to your face, and nobody else hears it, it's just about you and I make it to your face, that's not slander, even though it's false, all the statements I'm making, because I did not say it to someone else. I didn't publish it. In order for there to be defamation, either libel or slander, or maybe I wrote you a letter and I handed it to you, Nobody else reads it but you. There has to be a third party that either hears it or it's made to the public at large, like on the internet or something like that. 
Now, if I do that to you, it's not defamation because nobody else is aware of it. And again, the idea is your reputation is not being damaged because I'm saying it to you directly. It might be another tort, however. It might be infliction of emotional distress or something, but it's not going to be defamation. So there must be at least a, one person that is told or given the information otherwise.